everyone. Welcome to Pivot, a new content series by Zone Learning at Ryerson University. Um, although this is a virtual event, we'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement of the land that we occupy. I got ahead of myself though, but my name is Taylor Lewis Joseph. I work at the Office of Zone Learning as Community Engagement and Events Assistant. First, let's begin with the land acknowledgement. It's important to recognize the systems of colonization that have created barriers for some and privilege for others. Efforts for creating equity are hollow without an understanding of its historical contexts. We acknowledge the land that we are meeting on today is traditional territory of the many nations, including the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Wherever you are, we encourage you to acknowledge the land that you're on to. Okay, so a little bit about Zone Learning and Pivot. Zone Learning at Ryerson University prepares students for the 21st century employment by developing entrepreneurial mindsets and skill sets. Our 10 startup incubators or zones are enthusiastic communities that are invested in tackling real world problems with innovative solutions. Since 2010, our zones have incubated more than 3,500 startups, supported by more than 5,200 innovators, creating more than over 4,000 jobs, and raising over $750 million of funding. With this series, we want to pivot the conversation to be more inclusive and encourage debate around the ethics surrounding entrepreneurship and emerging technologies. Through Pivot, we aim to shift the narrative in Canada and Canadian entrepreneurship by leveraging the expertise of thought leaders from industries, academia, the public sector, and media. In Pivot's second session, we will explore whether brands are ever capable of being consistently authentic and what expectations are held over brands by their audiences. Data shows that younger markets are increasingly making purchase decisions based on moral or political preferences. Especially during the times of polarizing and active socio-political movements, entrepreneurs may feel more pressured to assign or avoid their personal views to their startup. So I'll now introduce John McRitchie, the Assistant Vice President of Zone Learning and Strategic Initiatives here at Ryerson. Uh, he will introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to my little ramble. Um, thanks, John. I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Taylor. And thanks, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. I'm pleased to introduce um, our speakers for this session this, this afternoon on, on brand authenticity. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to very happy to introduce Emily Mills. Emily is a founder of How She Hustles, and that she's an award-winning founder of How She Hustles, which is a Toronto-based network that reaches over 10,000 diverse women through special events and digital content. She's a proud Ryerson alum, and she studied journalism and public relations, has worked at the CBC and CTV, and is a frequent public speaker. Welcome, Emily. Leanne George is Director of Strategic Communications at the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. She is a content, content strategist, journalist, and brand builder with over two decades of experience in Canadian media. In 2018, Leanne founded George & Company, a brand consultancy that develops content strategies for companies, nonprofits, and startups. Previously, she served as editor-in-chief of Chatelaine and director of lifestyle content for Rogers Media. And she's held leadership roles at McLean's Canadian Business and was a founding editor of Torstar's internationally acclaimed City Weekly, The Grid. Our moderator this, for the session this afternoon is Takara Small. She's a technology com columnist with the CBC, uh, particularly with CBC's Metro Morning, which is Canada's number one morning radio show and the online on air expert for a variety of the broadcasters shows like CBC News, The National and more. She's a host producer for the Globe and Mail podcast, I'll Go First, which was rated number one technology podcast in Canada by Apple Canada and previously was contributing editor for Fortune magazine. Over the years, her award-winning work has appeared in numerous outlets, which include the BBC, Toronto Star, Refinery29, and Flair. And Flair magazine, Nick, and more. So I'd like to welcome all three of you this afternoon uh, here, and I will turn it over now to Takara, who will take us through the session. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Thank you for that uh, amazing intro. I always felt feel so um, uncomfortable when, when I hear my bio, but it's something I must overcome. Um, as mentioned, I'm really excited to talk about brand authenticity because it is something that so many people are talking about online um, in real life and something that I think most companies and entrepreneurs uh, are really concerned about getting right. So before we dive in uh, to this discussion with my esteemed panelists, I just want to go over what the definition of brand authenticity is for those who are, are watching at home. So it is defined, and, and this is from the Harvard Business Review, as a brand uh, at authenticity is the extent to which consumers perceive a brand to be faithful to itself and faithful to what consumers expect of that brand. And so that's what brand authenticity is, which can be challenging if you are a large company or a small business um, to really keep intact. And I think there's no better question to start off with than to ask my panelists what they think about brand authenticity and how they view it. I will uh, pivot to uh, Leanne first. Thanks, Takara. Um, so, I, I mean, I think this is such an interesting question and, um, and it's a tricky question because um, authenticity, when, when it becomes, um, authenticity itself has become sort of a brand goal, but by definition, you can't really create authenticity, you are authentic. It's a state of sort of being. So um, I think what we're really talking about when we're talking about brand authenticity is um, consistency, to your point. So do you, have, um, do you have a brand mission? Do you have a brand purpose? Do you know who you're talking to and what they care about? And do you have brand values? And then are you consistent? Do you take a position? Are you consistent? And are you accountable? For that position. I think that's what um, consumers are really looking for when, um, when they're evaluating whether or not a brand is authentic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Takara, and thank you. Nice to be here, Leanne, and really appreciate the opportunity to join today. Um, I think brand authenticity is really about keeping it real. Just, to, you know, textbook definitions are important, but I think that that's a key piece is for people to feel like your brand or your uh, personality um, as it appears online, on devices, across different platforms is truly you or at least representative of, an, of a key aspect of you. Of course, we all present what we want to the world, um, but I think there is a certain expectation that at least a good chunk of it is truly representative of who you are and what you stand for. I think the other piece about um, brand office, uh, authenticity is, um, in, in my case, uh, being somebody who is, uh, runs a women's network, I think it's really important for people to see not just the triumphs, but also the trials. And so uh, brand authenticity, I think, is not presenting an image of perfection, but also letting people know when you've messed up, <laughs> when you don't have all the answers, and more importantly, what the journey's like, not just the shiny destinations. Interesting. I like that. So it's not just showing the good, it's showing um, maybe the challenges uh, that you've had to overcome to get to the good place. All of that in itself is being authentic. I like that. I think so. I think so. That's what people are looking for. People don't just want to see when you win. People also want to know when you struggle and when you have moments of doubt. I mean, if we're speaking to entrepreneurs, that's probably the most valuable thing that you can share with people is not just when you win the awards or make the headlines, but what did it take to get there? That is part of what makes, I think, a brand authentic and appealing to people um, so that they can see themselves in you, not just see you as some shiny object on a desk that is aspirational but unrealistic. And, you know, as we continue on this shit, I do also want to share with everyone, if you have any questions, please make sure to use the hashtag the learning rather than you or brand activism because we will have a Q&A at the, at the end. And I myself have so many questions going through my mind. Uh, I want, want to make sure everyone at home has a chance to ask them too. Um, Emily, you kind of touched on something really interesting, which was um, showcasing the journey, not just um, the destination. So Leanne, Emily, you guys have both worked in media. I'm, and you know, you both also are entrepreneurs. How have you seen how we view brand authenticity change over the last five years? Actually, has it changed at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to say I love I love I love what Emily just said. I agree a hundred percent. And in in terms of the last five years, I would say it's been almost a, a, a total overhaul of of the way that brands function. And I'm speaking primarily about big brands, but then 
um, that has sort of, you know, there's sort of a, a, a bigger change that I think has permeated the entire culture and has affected the way that brands kind of function and, and, and need to function. Because, um, you know, when I started at, 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 the, at Chatelaine as editor in chief about five years ago, and I can't believe it's only five years ago, it was so different. It looked so different. Advertisers did not want to be anywhere near anything challenging, anything that would resemble activism. So we tried to integrate more stories about, you know, social issues, things like sexual violence and missing and murdered Indigenous women and, you know, abortion legislation and things like that. And, you know, it would give the sales team a heart attack because <laughs> advertisers did not want to touch any of this stuff. And that was only about five years ago because brands were very very controlled and you know I used to think of them um, you hear this term gatekeepers um, you know uh, editors and brands would function as sort of the gatekeepers that dictate you know in the world of women's magazines how women should look how they should dress mm -hmm. what how they should think you know what they should be like and you create this sort of affable environment for products and advertising and so I would say what's happened is and i had this um and i found it so exciting to watch in real time was you know with social media reaching this critical mass um you had women and i'm talking specifically in my experience at chatelaine here you had women sort of bypassing the gatekeepers and talking directly to each other and saying well, wait a minute like why do we care what they think about what we how we dress and what we think and what we care about and who are they to tell us that this isn't important or that's important or i should look like this and that was that flip has changed everything. And now, instead of telling women how to be, so in, in this case, um, brands are accountable to women and what women want them to be. And I think that that has been something that is that's radical. And I think it, I think because that's happened, we are seeing so much more um, grappling from brands with with issues that have been so conveniently, you know, swept under the rug for so long, they can't do that anymore. And I think that's because people have voices in platforms now. It's changed everything. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, when you when you spoke, Leanne, that's a perfect segue. I was just taking some notes and thinking about some of the big movements that I think have had a huge impact on the world socially, but economically. And of course that lands on the doorsteps of brands, whether they're big or small. So I think about things like Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. uh, movements like Idle No More, mm -hmm. uh, Me Too, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. I mean, look, when we were growing up there, at least when I was growing up, there was a lot of talk about you know the environment, for example, and climate change. And those are still massive, massive uh, global conversations that are happening. But I think, um, what we're seeing is a lot of intersectional conversations now. Mm -hmm. How do these different movements impact different demographics? And then how are these brands expected to respond? And I think as well as uh, organizations become more diverse on the inside and as their customer bases diversify, their investors diversify, there's pressure from all sides. I mean, I can't think of, uh, in my experience, kind of speaking to different groups, especially if they're passionate about women's issues or entrepreneurship, a lot of their employees, for example, are pushing for, you know, what are you doing around diversity and inclusion or equity? What are you doing around women? And so there's in, a lot of internal dialogue. Then from, as, as Leanne mentioned, from the external social media piece and from the consumer piece, it's like, well, we want to know what do you stand for? What do you support? Um, and that's why I think more and more we're seeing things like the 30% club or the 15% pledge, these kind of large global movements um, or uh, campaigns or rally cries for brands to sign on and take action because they know people are watching. And so, you know, question for both of you, do you think large companies, these, you know, brands that have so much power and there are so many eyeballs on them have a responsibility and or should in some way engage with the social causes of the moment? Certain question. I yeah, I mean, I'm. I I would I would say that there is a there is a, a an absolute imp imperative and expectation, um, and I think, you know, I think that obviously it's different for different brands. I mean, depending on sort of where you from how you come at 
uh, an issue. But I think that the expectation is that brands um, need to function more as a platform. They're not only there to 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 sell and to sort of uh, extract money, <laughs> revenue from an audience or a consumer base. They're also there to serve that consumer group, to listen right. to that consumer group, to represent that consumer group, and 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 they have to understand uh, the role that they play in these conversations and the role that they play has never been more um, such because people to your point and Emily said this earlier people people are voting for brands in in a way with their you know they're spending money yeah they're saying you know I like this company because they show women who who look like me whose bodies are like mine who are not all sort of maybe 17 you know here's a here's a woman with with, with gray hair you know that's that's exciting to me because it tells me that this brand sees me people uh, that is that, that is valuable to to people so i think that there is an imperative for brands to really think about you know their role in the in the larger community that they're trying to serve beyond just selling them stuff yeah i think definitely there is a, a, an opportunity and in many cases a responsibility for brands to jump in but it is definitely a tricky road to go down um in action isn't an option um in so many ways and there have been times even over the last two years where i've had to stop and pause and think myself as, as an entrepreneur who is just continuing to grow um, my vision you know when and where do i jump hop in what do i say when do i want to say it. Um, but as I said, I think at the end of the day, inaction is usually not the option. Um, with that said, though, just because there's a cause out there doesn't mean that it, it's your time and place and the right cause for you to hop in on. I think that there are so many brands who felt pressured, for example, during the Black Lives Matter movement to hop in and, you know, black out their timelines. But there wasn't really any substance behind the social media content. And I think that has actually backfired for some folks um, where, you know, if you're not following up with concrete action, don't think that people have a short memory. You know, there are people who are really paying attention who are going to remember that or um, look a little deeper. You know, they're gonna go like, great, you've posted a statement online. Uh, but if I then, for example, I know as, as, and I'm sure you know Takara as somebody who's very involved in media, there were many media organizations that were coming out post Black Lives Matter and really trying to, to cover the stories. And then there was this almost this counter current, this counter conversation around being black in the newsroom. And people saying, that's great. You're covering all these stories about Black Lives Matter, let me tell you about what it's like to be Black working here and some of the challenges and experiences of being Black in Canadian media, et cetera. And so I think it's important to jump in, but before that happens, it's really about what is your internal commitment to the, do the work? Are you comfortable saying, we don't have it all right, but we're working on things? And more importantly, is there some concrete action that you're taking, even if it's not perfect? And I put my hand up to say, I'm not perfect either. I'm working on some things, but I think that's part of that brand authenticity is telling people that when you come out with these statements. And I think that really touches on uh, what we said previously about being authentic, which means showing the journey. So if you are, you are, you want to be authentic and, and practice authenticity, showcasing to consumers and the public that, hey, you're working on it, you may not be perfect, is a great way to do that. Um, and I think this delves into a really great discussion I want to have about, um, you know, smaller companies, smaller businesses or even entrepreneurs or social media personalities who do want to be authentic and they want to champion causes, but they may not have the reach or uh, the revenue like Nike does. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. So many people care, but they may not know how to go about showing it in an authentic way. What are your thoughts on that, um, Emily and Leanne? Is there a wrong way to show you care? I think for uh, I think for me, uh, you know, for smaller brands, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. Sorry, I'm just... <clears throat> oh, hi, hi, Leanne. Everything okay? Oh, we will... I'm so, we I'm we so sorry, Kerr. Can you just repeat the last part of the question? I I froze there for a moment. Yeah. Oh no, no, my pleasure. This is this is a COVID situation. Everyone, we're all at home using technology. Um, so yes. Yeah, so I was just wondering, <laughs> is there? Um, a wrong way to show you care and to champion causes because you know there are large companies like Nike who have um, been very forthright with how they're going to support black athletes or they're going to support causes that um, align with their goals but 
not every social media personality, not every small business owner, not every entrepreneur has the resources um, or, you know, the knowledge and know-how how to go about doing that. So is there a wrong way to go about? Hi, wrong? I'm sorry. Hi, I'm so sorry. I'm back. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. Yes. It's okay. Yes, there is. I mean, I think I, I absolutely think there's a wrong way. And, and I mean, I, lo I love everything Emily has said about authenticity. And because I think that when you're, especially when you're starting a new company, a new brand, that's why I think it's, the, it's an important exercise to go through, you know, what are your values? What is your social good platform? What are you giving back? What are you contributing to the community that you're setting up to serve aside from the products that you're selling them or the services you're selling them? Because, I think that this, that social, your social good platform, your, your values have to be built into to what you do, not only in terms of your messaging and certainly not only in terms of your messaging when a big event happens, but also, you know, how you, how you hire, how you source your vendors, how do you, how you source materials, you know, if you are a company that really believes in, um, in, you know, is, is, is concerned about environment, but the environment, where are you, are you making difficult choices that may cost you a little more money, but you're buying the biodegradable product versus the, you know, the toxic product. Um, like, these are all of these little choices and all of these, they, they all should be of a piece. And this is, you know, to, to um, Emily's point about keeping it real, like it, it's, 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 you need to be consistent. You need to, you need to know, you know, you need to know what you're about and then you need to be consistent and you need to be accountable. So when you make a mistake, you need to be transparent about it and say, you know what, I'm not perfect. You know, we made a mistake. This is how the, but, but, but always coming back to those values, always coming back to those values. Um, and one thing I thought was so interesting in terms of a quick example of, of a company that, you know, um, tried and I think failed recently was um, uh, the gap <laughs> putting out you know in the heat of the election putting out that sweatshirt I'm not sure if people if you saw that hoodie that they put out it for those of us who haven't seen it it was they put out a hoodie um, like a special edition hoodie that was half red and half blue and it was like basically the and this was in the heat of the election when people hadn't yeah. people didn't even know who who, who was going to win or how it was going to play out and it was just like the message was you know what we're all this we, we can all just come together we just have to get along and I think it was like they really missed the point that no it's not that you know you think this and I think that but like let's all get along it's it's I think your side is wrong <laughs> that people were feeling very strongly it's not about just kind of coming together and um and pretending everything's okay it's we have a lot of work to do and mm -hmm. they really missed the mark on that and we're just sort of slammed on social media for for this attempt which seemed just kind of like an, an opportunity there were it seemed kind of like an opportunity to you know um like a marketing opportunity that backfired yes and i think they eventually removed deleted oh yeah they, yeah. they they, but they acknowledged that they that it was too soon and it was the wrong message. And um, so, I mean, I think they handled it properly. But yeah, I think it's it's really important. Um, and you can't you can get it wrong. I think for the absolutely there are definitely and when you do get it wrong, I agree, you got to address it and also stick with it. Um, I think sometimes though it has to do with the ways to get it the ways to get it right um, are about hiring, but also about dare I say it firing. Um, I think that there are some brands that um, in order for them to be brand authentic um, and to really stand behind their values, it doesn't just mean putting up a positive brand campaign. It means when you also have people who have go against your values, against your policy, against your brand because of their uh, conduct, that, you know, there's action that needs to be taken and that could be on the extreme end, letting people go. Um, I certainly have had several conversations with brands here in Canada and in the US over the last year, um, sharing some of my experience through How She Hustles and my experience as a black woman formerly working in mainstream media. And it's amazing how often I hear from people, you know, about the blatant racism, microaggressions, discrimination that they deal with sometimes in their own companies. And so brands will have these amazing campaigns out there. And then you speak to their own staff and 
that's not the value that is living and breathing in, inside a corporate culture. So I think that piece is really important. Um, I would also say in terms of an example of, of one brand that I thought responded well, um, I remember when Kayla Gray, uh, who is a yeah. media personality, was speaking out very uh, frankly about her experience uh, you know, as a Black journalist and some of the uh, aggressions that she was dealing with. And uh, she was tagged in a thread and people were trying to tag basically uh, some senior executives at her company. And it was amazing to see the brand just come swoop right in instantly on social media. I think it was the same night with a statement basically saying, we stand behind our employee because we believe that this is the way that uh, black employees should be treated. These issues are important, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes it's a policy thing and sometimes it's just a messaging um, that can really be a, a huge indicator. Um, I would also say just very briefly in terms of the way that entrepreneurs can show their support. I look at people like Tracy Moore, for example. Again, these are media personalities that I follow, but many of them are also entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Tracy Moore has her own brand, uh, her own clothing line uh, mm -hmm. with Frida's, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I love about somebody like Tracy Moore is that she is using, um, leveraging really her her huge brand presence and all of her thousands of followers across the country from different demographics to cross promote black owned brands. You know, whether she's, you know, the other day she was wearing a hoodie and it was her opportunity to be like, this is a brand that you can support, but also using her platform to educate. Um, and we saw that all this year. Uh, it could be tips on how to deal with microaggressions, how to deal with difficult conversations, but actually giving people practical tools, language, on her Instagram of what you can say when difficult conversations come up. And I think that's another way that doesn't cost a lot to just show people what your brand really stands for. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a recurring th theme in our conversation about how social media can be very useful. Um, when <laughs> done right, you can use social media to showcase your brand's authenticity, your beliefs, um, but when done wrong, it could also damage um, what you what your company hopes to achieve. So it's really important to get it right. Um, I, I we've talked a little bit about the U.S. It's come up in conversation. And we talk about Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. I'd love to know what your thoughts are um, about how Canadian companies, entrepreneurs, businesses react to social movements that largely I feel like look at what the U.S. is doing. Um, so for for a lot of what's happening um, with Black Lives Matter, for instance. Um, companies were mimicking what US companies were doing. With the Me Too movement, there was a lot of public discourse, a lot of change, but it, a lot of the time also resulted in seeing what our neighbors to the South did. Um, and what are your thoughts about that for both of you? Yeah, I, th <clears throat> I, th hmm. I, th I think, um, you know, it, we often defer to, we often sort of look and see what the big, the big brands are gonna do and, and then how people are going to respond. But I also, I mean, I, I feel like, um, I, you know, I really like, again, I, I, I really appreciate what, what Emily said about understanding what's appropriate for your brand and when you, when it's the right time for you to speak up and when it's the right time for you to hold space for someone else. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that unless you are contributing actively to a solution, unless whether it is in, you know, the way that you are um, supporting your team internally, the way you are participating in conversations, your messaging, the way you are, um, you know, your the, per, the decisions that you're making, the business decisions you're making, and the, um, you know, are you contributing some of your profits? Are you supporting um, a cause beyond just a post, right? Because I, I think that the idea that um, you, there are a lot of brands, I think, that made the mistake of thinking, well, uh, you know, this is, um, I, can, I can participate in the almost halo effect. Of, of, of speaking out on this issue without contributing in any real way at all to any potential solution. And I think that that is just not the case. I think that you have to be willing to think about if you're gonna participate in a conversation, you have to have done the work to think about what is your role? What is your role? How are you helping, you know? Yeah. 
<clears throat> can I, I hop in here, Takara? I, I don't know if it's necessarily so much about the Canadian American thing, but I, I wanted to say a couple of things that I think I had missed um, around kind of the brand auth authenticity piece for the larger organizations. I think there are a couple of uh, areas that are also so important to this conversation. Um, part of it is looking at your senior leadership team. Um, you know, brands can talk about whatever they talk about, but I, as a as a woman of color and a black woman specifically, and as a woman and a mom, um, when I hear organizations talk about gender equity um, or anti-black racism or discrimination, um, that's wonderful. But I also think that there are ways that there are barriers created that aren't so blatant, um, that may not be so um, in your face. And sometimes those can be systemic obstacles. And so I think for brands that are really gonna stand up and say these issues matter, one of the first things I'm gonna look at is who's on your board of directors? And even if it's not representative, what efforts are you making? Uh, who's on your senior leadership team or your C-suite? Who is up at the top? Are you just parachuting in somebody for the very first time or have you been working on um, you know, EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, you know, issues for a long time. Uh, I think the other piece is around supplier diversity. You know, so many brands want to talk about, you know, and it's not easy as an entrepreneur myself. I constantly have to think about, I'll give you a very candid example. Um, I've been looking at um, creating some merchandise, for example. And one of the questions I had for this big, uh, for Shopify, big e-commerce platform is, Tell me about the BIPOC and women-owned um, drop shipping options that are available to me. And it, am I, am I, uh, is there a tool that allows me to search specifically for those demographics if that matters to me? Since How She Hustles started, it's been so important for us to work almost exclusively uh, with uh, women, particularly women of color and all that we do. And sometimes, to Leanne's point, it costs more. If we, before COVID, when we were going to hotels, we got to a point after doing events for seven years, we were like, if you want 250 black and brown women in your ballroom, I'm telling you right now, we are not paying for your in-house AV if we can bring in a young woman who is gonna run the boards, who happens to be a woman of color who wouldn't have the opportunity otherwise. And that's where we're choosing to invest our money or we're bringing in our own caterer. And sometimes that means we have to pay a 15, 10 to 15% markup to bring in somebody who isn't already on the books. So supplier diversity is an important uh, piece. And the last thing I would say is also where you choose to advertise. You know, as somebody with a marketing background, I tell you, there is so much money that just gets funneled through to places that are just making all kinds of dollars. And so not all of it is necessarily about what you see, it's how the message gets to people. And that is also a really important piece is where is your brand choosing to spread the message? And is that channel also creating um, more equity or standing in line with the values that matter to your brand? Mm -hmm. You said something really interesting about, um, you know, sometimes companies that parachute someone in to add that diversity <laughs> to their board or their company or their in employee numbers. And I'm wondering what if, if there is a brand right now who is watching and they do recognize that they need to do better, how do they make those changes without parachuting someone in and putting them in a position where they could fail? Where how can they add diversity, more inclusivity to their employee base in a in a really great inclusive way? Because I think a lot of people right now are thinking or recognizing, hey, I need to do better. And I, I fear that they'll just hire someone to represent the, the diversity that they think is needed. I'm gonna be short and then I'm gonna turn over to Leanne because I don't wanna take up too much time, but in my humble, humble, and again, I think that's the first place to start is humble juice for all of us. You know, I'm a black woman, but I also have all kinds of privileges that people may not see. You know, I was born and raised in this country. I, you know, university educated, worked in different places. You know, English is my first language. There's all kinds of things that I don't wear as, as a badge of pride, but they're just, they're things that help to define me. And I know that there are other people who may look like me on the outside who may have a very different lived experience. So I think the first thing is regardless of the size or the focus of your company is to to understand that humility, that everybody's diverse experience is different and lived experience is different. To create, I think, a more inclusive um, workplace or environment or brand strategy, I think a big part of it is being inclusive of the people who know your brand best. And those are your employees, your freelancers, your contractors. It's amazing how many of these policies are created in a vacuum. 
it's like people are so scared to talk about it, so afraid to get it wrong, that often it's a bunch of executives who go into a room, come up with a plan, hire an external consultant, but never have the courageous conversation to speak to their own staff. Tell me what isn't working about being here, working with us, the brand. Then you can go out and do some work with some external folks who have expertise or lived experience. I think maybe one of the other pieces that I'll just say very quickly is, um, two pieces I'll say really quickly, not just hiring one person, hire in a cohort, if it's at all possible. It is so unfair, I think, and unrealistic and often um, counterproductive to hire one person who is responsible for all the diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives and think that that person can have a magic wand and solve everything. It's important to have different perspectives within that diversity lens, but also different people who are accountable for the work so people don't burn out and different perspectives and ideas. So hiring a group of people who can work together, I think is important. And lastly, resource accordingly. It is amazing, you know, whether you're a big company or a little entrepreneur shop who's still working from a co-working space or off the side of your desk like I am with a whole bunch of freelancers, um, if something really matters to you, you're gonna invest in it. And if that means your budget, time, um, support, you're gonna put that in there. And so I think so often, if we don't put a budget line aside for this, to me, it says, this isn't important to your brand. I'll give you a very quick example to end there. If somebody says to me, oh, which has happened to me more times than I can count this year, Hi, I'm calling from this big brand. We've heard about how she hustles. We're so passionate about creating a more inclusive strategy. We'd love to have you come and talk to our employees or we'd love your opinion. Great. We have no budget. So you're telling me on one hand, you need this expertise so bad that you can't find it within your own team or your own company or your own area of expertise. And yet you want me to give up my time for free. I wouldn't do that to anyone else if this really mattered to me, if I wanted a product or a service. So why, when it comes to certain areas that people say matter to their brand, is that the case? Mm -hmm. I love it. I love your answer. Um, Leanne, is there anything? I mean, that was, I, that was an amazing, that was an amazing answer. And I, I don't know that I have anything to add to that because I, I think that Emily explain that so beautifully. And, you know, I, I, I think for, for me and my experience as a manager, it has come down to, and as a, a founder of a company, it, it really is the humility, understanding my privileges, understanding what I, that, that there are things that I don't know, and being willing to sort of ask the, 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 the questions. And, um, and, and, and I agree 100% about prioritizing um, resources to improve, improve, um, you know, to dedicate to EDI initiatives inter in, internally, because I think, um, I, I, I think that there is this assumption that um, certain people on staff, you know, the, the, the women, the women of color, um, people will take on that work in addition to whatever other work they're doing. And um, that is a, a, a tremendously unfair assumption. And I think it is one that I, I, I hope that people are starting to understand that that is, that is labor, that is work, and that should be, that is work that needs to be compensated, so. Here, here. <laughs> I would say that. I also want to say too, very quickly, just because I didn't say that before, just around the humble juice that I had an experience this year. And I, I you know, just recently actually on social media where uh, we were, um, you know, where somebody was saying, well, you know, I don't see, for example, women with hijabs who are part of, uh, part of one of your programs. And, um, you know, I'd like to see more more brown women represented in, in your work. And I, there were a couple of things that came out of that. One of, the, one of them was, you know, I felt very confident that there had been many women who were uh, proud women, who were black women, brown women, who wore hijabs, who were coming to our events, and that we'd been very mindful and thoughtful about things like when we hosted How She Hustles events, um, 
you know, thinking about is this event going to overlap, for example, with a um, with an observance and might create a conflict. You know, um, there's a lots of discussion around uh, some of the aspects of things that you do that might be uh, silent uh, indicators to people that they are not welcome. Things like alcohol, for example, if people don't consume. So, you know, we had no problems starting to just make okay, our our, our drink of choice for the next How She Hustle event, our signature drink is going to be, uh, you know, ginger beer or sorrel, which are Caribbean drinks that have no alcohol in them anybody can drink them it's fine so we had to start to think about those things but also I think it made me feel very comfortable saying yeah I'd like more here's what we're proud of we've had you know women with hijabs taking photos and uh, being part of our events as speakers and so on and we had lots of photos and documentation of that so I, that made me feel great and it was a good reminder that even if you don't have things perfect big brand small brand document the intentional decisions you've made along the way so that when people do come for you if they do it's not about being defensive and being like look at all the stuff i did but you can say here's how our journey has evolved here are the small steps we've taken along the way and look how far it's taken us we still got a long way to go but we've made some intentional decisions and we've documented some of those along the way we've asked for feedback along the way and yeah, you know what? We're going to take this feedback and I think it's fuel for us to even step it up even more. So I think, you know, um, criticism is not always a bad thing. Uh, often, you know, we're terrified as brands, big or small, of being criticized publicly. But I think what it often tells you is uh, it gives you a roadmap on more work that needs to be done, but also gives you an opportunity to, to reflect on some of the things that you should be proud of. And um, I know we're, we're close to the end of our panel time I, I i'm really curious to hear from you guys about you know where you see things going in the future um i you know there are a lot of big brands and big companies right now that are talking and saying the right things um but i wonder is this just a moment in time or is this a movement that will continue on long into the future um and i'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that I'm hopeful it's more than just a moment in time, but yeah. I, I mean, I think it's easy to be um, skeptical, if not cynical, about some of the big companies that are kind of stepping in and saying, okay, well, we're, we're going to, you know, um, we're going to make, we, we, we care a lot all of a sudden. You know, I, I often think about sometimes when you see a brand that you have been you know, has been on your radar for decades and you see them do this total 180 and you're just like, how do I feel about this? I mean, I think of Special K and it used to be, you, when I was a kid, it was, you can't pinch an inch on me. And it was all about how Special K is gonna help make you skinny. And, and now Special K, their whole brand revolves around, you know, showcasing different body types and celebrating different body types. So I feel like, do I accept that? Do I not accept that? And it's easy to be cynical and skeptical. But I do think, you know, when you see a company like Sephora taking the, you know, the 15% pledge or, or, or more locally, nationally, Indigo has, has recently taken, um, made the 15% pledge. And I think, um, regardless of what the motivation is, whether it's, you know, good marketing or whether it is a sincere desire to be part of a movement or part of a bigger change, um, I think it, we, they are introducing systemic changes that, that are going to, I hope, snowball, right? I mean, I, 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 I hope they are going to normalize things that have been, you know, if it, if it is odd to see, um, uh, black owned brands on on the shelves of Sephora that's that's a problem let's normalize that let's think and I think just by just by um bringing in a 15 percent pledge um the result is going to be that these brands are given the important shelf space that they that they need to succeed and they are going to find their consumers and they are going to find their audience and I think that I hope that we will see a bit of a, a snowball effect as more companies, big companies, start to introduce these systemic changes into these massive operations. Mm -hmm. And I want to just pause for a second to say the 15% pledge for those who don't know what it is. Um, it's um, it was actually the initiative of another Ryerson, Ryersonian, um, Aurora James, a Canadian, which is uh, really great and really interesting. It was in the cover of Vogue as well, not too recently. 
um, who, which um, advocates for companies who adhere to the 15% pledge to have 15% uh, of their shelf space, um, the products they sell, um, et cetera, um, allocated to black owned businesses or black owned brands. Um, and it's a, it's a way for you know uh, business owners who traditionally have not been able to really get into these spaces um, to start selling their their products and of course you know consumers will decide what what is good and what is not but for a very long time you know underrepresented founders just could not get into these huge spaces um, so that's just one way um, and I think it's a great example Leanne of showing how you can extend um, a moment in time into an ongoing movement that will uplift um, others and showcase how much you care um, Emily, um, what are your thoughts? I, I too hope that it will be a movement, not a moment. Um, but I also feel like there was a lot of movement happening already. And some of these larger mainstream um, movements or uh, you know, activism that is making headlines like the 15% pledge or even the Black North, North Initiative more recently um, uh, by Wes Hall, you know, I think those uh, are opportunities to showcase a lot of activism that's already been underway. Maybe it hasn't hit the mainstream or some of these larger retailers, but this isn't new. There have been, peop been people who have been pushing for action, for uh, social impact initiatives, for better connection to communities, for business for good for a long time. Um, and so hopefully this moment turns into a movement to recognize that really this is in some ways legacy work that has already long begun and it's just time to, to step, their, uh, step our game up. I do want to just mention shout out to um, um, Rachel Lee Ricard. So Rachel Lee, for example, was part of our recent Startup and Slay series that we put together a digital series on entrepreneurs who are um, diverse women and non-binary. And she actually uh, just, we just wrapped the series. You can watch it online or on our website, but her product is now in Chapters Indigo. She is a black owned candle based business, real talk candles. And it has been amazing to watch her series, uh, her products um, and the way she announced it and bringing the community with her so that it's not just a headline that people in our community can see a real entrepreneur that we know, Jamaican-born, GTA-raised, started making her candles out of her own shop after a traumatic experience. She started making them to manage her own emotions, now has this product in. And I think what's been amazing is to see that this has generated an, a whole new customer base for this major retailer. I mean, if you follow her on social media, you'll see, for example, she was selling out products before the end of it. She couldn't even keep up with the stock and the demand. And so I think that is an important message is that, you know, these brands that are doing this work, this isn't just feel good. Yes, it is an important value uh, statement. And it's an important piece to, to really say, what does your brand stand for? But there's also a business imperative. You got a whole bunch of new customers who are like, yeah, maybe I'll go to Chapters Indigo. But now they have people who are driving across the GTA to go to one location in the East End to stock up on like 15, 20 candles from this black owned brand that speaks to them and speaks to their Jamaican mom. So I just wanna really drive that piece home that brand authenticity is an opportunity on many, many levels, not just for values, but also it's good business. It's good business. I love it. And I, I do have a little bit more time. So I'm curious, let's pivot a little bit. I keep using the word pivot, my attempt at a pun. Um, pivot a little bit um, from looking at things from the brand perspective. Do you guys have any advice for maybe consumers who are watching this? And they're like, I want to support a brand that's doing good in the long term, not just as part of a short term campaign. What would you suggest um, to those individuals? Um, if either, either one of you, please feel free to take it away. Maybe Leanne, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 in, hmm, I would say in terms of, um, I mean, I think we know that people want to support brands that, um, you know, that, that, that live the values that, that, that they want to live, that they identify with, that they, um, that they feel I, I think people are spending more with um, with that in mind. Like, and so I would just say as a consumer, um, 
I think a lot of this, a lot of this messaging or discovery of these brands, I think is really still the challenge for, I think a lot of small businesses, right? I mean, so that's why I'm sort of hesitating here in terms of, in terms of advice to, to the consumers about, I think, I think discovery is a, is a, is a, is a big issue. So it's really about um, trying to uh, do your part to research the companies and the brands and the, the founders and the, you know, the, um, the, the, the young businesses out there that are really trying to, um, to, 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 to work in a new way and establish a, a new model of, of business and, and who bring something different to, to the marketplace, you know, who just bring something different that is not sort of, you know, to, 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 to this point of, of, of gatekeepers, right? I mean, Sephora, historically, a gatekeeper, Indigo, a gatekeeper, right? So um, it is wonderful that, that there is a business imperative for the gatekeepers now to sort of open up, you know, open up the, the, the gates. But I also think that it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's still a challenge for, for young businesses to get out there and be discovered. So, I mean, I, I would love to know, I mean, Emily, you've worked with so many entrepreneurs. Like, I really think that your, your perspective here is, is, is more valuable than mine. And I, 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 I would love to know what you think. Yeah, Emily. Well, you know, if there are if there are no objections, I just want to shout out. Uh, they're not consumers, but I, I want to shout out a big brand that supported me, which is CIBC. They've been with us since 2018. The very first corporate sponsor that we had to help do what we do um, when we needed additional resources to just like produce all of these events. We've been doing them for 10 years. And as we grew and we were like, oh my gosh, we now, now we have like 250 women coming. Like, how do we do all the things that we need to do? Um, and so having their support was huge. Uh, Ryerson has uh, also worked with us on the Startup and Slate project I mentioned. So, um, you know, there's what consumers can do, but I also think that there are bigger brands that can help smaller brands. Um, and I think that's a really important piece is figuring out how to align and help help those businesses understand your sophisticated processes. And um, maybe there are things that you can teach them around, you know, brand management or financial management, partnership negotiation, um, all of those pieces. I think from a consumer standpoint, certainly shopping, and supporting is one thing you could do, and that's important. Making that sale um, with a brand that you re you align with or resonates with you. But there are also other things that don't cost anything. Things like voting. You know, if a brand is up for an award or recognition, usually there's no cost to do that. You know, vote, click, nominate, even. Um, so important to see if you can nominate. You know, is there a local brand or a small business that could totally benefit from the recognition? That's how we got a lot of people applying for Startup and Slay. And then they got this national media exposure that helped their business with sales and buzz, et cetera. Amplifying and engaging on social media, that doesn't cost anything. Retweet, comment, tell them you like something, um, give them your feedback. That's a great way. Um, and I would also say, ask them what they need. You know, So often people assume that what a business needs is like, I need you to buy something. What if there's something that that business or startup or that entrepreneur needs that maybe they're not articulating in a big Instagram post? Um, it doesn't hurt to ask. And I tell you, some doors have opened for me this year, thanks to people who have been like, I see what you're doing. What do you need? And it's amazing what the offline conversations have created. I love that. And um, we actually have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, first one is, um, did you see anyone I guess recently do um, a bad job or was tone deaf um, lately with the example, um, Leanne mentioned the Gap sweatshirt incident. Um, so you, have you seen anyone, maybe social media, maybe a company, maybe a small brand um, that have you know done a tone deaf job? I'd like to add to that and say, if, is there anyone you've seen that's done a good job um, as well? Let's not just, you know, not just a bad job. Um, so who wants to to tackle that first? I know Leanne, you already mentioned the Gap sweatshirt. So um, Emily, I will start with you. Is there anyone you've seen done a, a, like a social media person that's done a good job um, already? I know you mentioned a couple actually, Tracy. Um, yes. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the names out of the ones that I don't like, but I'll give you the examples and a couple of I would say more around personalities. You know, uh, more and more I think there's this blur between uh, people who are have growing influence on social media, but then they also have their own side business or their entrepreneurs in their own right. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I love, 
in terms of big brands, I love Michelle Obama. I just think she does an exceptional job of just, you know, obviously after watching Becoming and reading her book and have had the good pleasure of meeting her once. Um, but I know that there's so much that goes into every tweet, every post, but I still feel like, I mean, I'm a, I don't know her obviously, but I feel like she's doing a really good job of speaking to the world in a voice that seems very authentic to her. And it seems very in line with what we saw during her time, you know, um, at the White House. And uh, so I think there are personalities like that who can keep it real about everything from uh, what it's like to do a job to what it's like to do a job with your particular lived experience. So that's a good example. I would say, um, more locally, I love following Brandon Gones on Twitter. Uh, he's a media personality with CP24. I just think, um, you know, I'm an immigrant's daughter and watching him the other day, I think it was trending. Like he was doing a live hit and then he was surprised by something and he was like, eh, eh, which is very much a very Jamaican Caribbean um, response to something. It's something that you would say to your like your auntie or your friend and to see him say that on the air. And I was like, oh my gosh this is somebody who I can relate to. So there's stuff like that. I would just say in terms of brands, I will mention them without saying their names. I think it's been really interesting to watch major campaigns roll, across, roll out across the country. Uh, for example, there's a major media outlet that does a campaign every year. Um, and just to see the conversation, you know, trying to elevate people's mental health. On the other hand, to read some of the comments sometimes is really discouraging because sometimes people are mm -hmm. like, well, let me tell you some stories about what it's like to work there. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've really got to be careful when you're putting out a brand again, you know, is there going to be a potentially a countercurrent with people who have lived experience that counters that brand experience? Um, and also I think many of us know, you know, there's a brand mm -hmm. that is fighting to continue to be um, Canada's uh, beverage, warm beverage of choice. And I think we all recall a couple of years ago, huge controversy around um, certain locations of that brand having some real challenges around staff treatment, um, breaks and so on. And so I think, you know, if, if you don't address some of these issues, uh, they really can leave lingering impressions um, with consumers around your brand and your brand can be strong, but I think people relate to people's stories. And so if the people's stories and if they're negative and they outweigh your positive brand message, I think that's where you really come in with a, a tough, tough situation. I think that's a really, really great point about um, addressing the issue instead of just ignoring it. Because sometimes companies think, well, if I address it, it'll draw more attention to it. So we just won't talk about it. But it's um, it doesn't work like that always. Um, and uh, Leanne, are, is, are there any social media personalities, any well-known figures? Um, anyone, you know, company in general, you've seen that's done like a really good job and one that like needs, that has, uh, needs more work or, or drop the ball. I always think the ones that, I always think that the ones that do, ha, that I, that do a really good job are the ones that kind of were talking that talk all along, right? I mean, I think that like you see a company, like even sometimes it's surprising, right? Like it'll be a company like Ben and Jerry's who, you know, I think they were arrested. I think the, the the founders were arrested at a protest, you know, because, and this has always been um, uh, race, racial injustice in, in, in the United States has always been um, uh, an issue that they've, they've taken a strong stance on and which is like, you know, unexpected for an ice cream company. But I think what, what the reason I think they're notable is that um, it didn't start with, with, uh, Black Lives Matter. It, it is something that this type of activism is built into their brand, and they've they've always taken positions on challenging uh, issues, regardless of what their customers are going to think. And so, I, I always admire that sort of thing. And I think an, a, a counter example, and now I feel bad using the actual brand name, but um, I think a counter example 
another coffee chain. I'm not sure if we're talking about the same coffee chain, but you know, the <laughs> the world's biggest coffee chain. Uh, you know, the 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 founder they very clearly put out messaging in support of Black Lives Matters, but then told their um, their baristas and their staff that you're not allowed to you know wear anything or present any sort of support um, in for the in, movement, yeah. for the movement in, in in your your work your work environment, which um, is very, that message is very much at odds. You, you're either supportive and you encourage your employees support or, or you're not. And so I think that that is where that consistency piece is. You figure out, you know, who you are and who you want to be, what do you value, and then um, act accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was interesting with the coffee shop that you mentioned because they later backtracked um, after there was social yep. media outrage. Right. Um, and I guess in a way, um, I, I feel like social media is a way for companies to test and to see in real time what works and what doesn't. Right. Um, Cause that seems to sway a lot of companies these days on how they approach certain issues, um, in a way, which is interesting. It is, but I also think, you know, you've got to decide who you're going to stand for and what you're going to stand for. Um, and these, you know, I'm not immune to these conversations either. You know, I constantly think about what is how she hustles stand for, you know, who, who is it that that is our core audience and we can't be everything for everyone. Um, and that says as an entrepreneur is a very difficult experience to ex difficult thing to kind of grapple with right um but i think it's better to be candid about that and try and figure out um and be candid with your audience the best that you can you know it's like this is what we stand for and this is how we're going to be an ally to this group and here's the concrete actions we've taken and here's the work we think we still need to take and yes we want to keep hearing from you i think that's the best you can do sometimes mm -hmm. uh, we yeah. have another oh yes Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say to I was going to say to that point to Emily's point. I I think if you think of brands as sort of a living thing, right? I mean, it's a living thing that um, evolves, and um, so if 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 you if if you make a mistake, you know, I think that I think that is why it's so important to be transparent and to to sort of come to sort of be okay uh, to make mistakes at times because I think you you can change course and I think it's important for brands to understand that if you do make a mistake that's not the end you know there is a path um, it's just a matter of, of of finding it and you know yeah I Leanne I, I'm smiling because that was actually another question from one of our you touched on it perfectly um, someone uh, had a question was and I'll read this word for word um, what's a good way to apologize slash learn publicly when your brand or company makes a misstep on social issues as well intentioned as it may be. Um, so how can they apologize and then learn publicly from that if they've, you know, made a mistake or uh, committed a misstep? What, what are your thoughts? I mean, you kind of touched on it already, um, which is, a, you know, being very transparent. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think depending on what the issue is, and depending on what I mean, I think like I, I don't, I, as someone who has worked on a lot of brands and managed a lot of brands, I do not have all the answers to all of these very difficult and complex questions, and I don't think any one individual does. And behind all of these brands are people who are making good decisions and bad decisions. And so I, I think that it really does come down to um, a true commitment and desire to learn to listen and to learn. And, and I think if you really kind of root yourself in that, I, I, I think then that, that is the best you can do. That is the best position you can, you can operate from. And Emily, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it goes back to some of the things that I said before, you know, if there are things that you've already been working on that may not be perfect, but demonstrate your commitment to doing the work. Um, it's a great opportunity to kind of look at that. And uh, maybe that's an opportunity to say, you know, here's what we haven't been doing right, but here's what we've been trying and we're gonna keep going at it. Um, I think another good way to, of, of, of kind of addressing some missteps is also to, uh, 
take the opportunity again to speak to the people who are most impacted first. Uh, make sure that you speak to your, your, your staff, your customers, maybe it's your, some of your vendors or suppliers, so that they hear from you first um, about some of the challenges um, or some of the issues that you've been grappling with and what you're going to do about them. Um, and then lastly, I guess I would also say just, you know, don't abandon the issue if you don't have to. I think it's, you know, as I mentioned, you know, when when people kind of challenge me on something, it's not like, okay, I, I'm, I'm so upset or I've addressed it now and it's done. I think it's something that's constantly uh, germinating in my mind and I'm thinking, okay, if this really matters to me, then whether I choose to broadcast it on social media right now or not, what is my kind of sustained commitment to doing the work? And some of that work is offline. This is the trick about social media. Sometimes if people don't see something live online, they think it's not happening. Um, and so it's about being really strategic when you come back to an issue and let people know, you know, a year ago this happened, we, ad you know, we addressed it and six months later, here's what we've done to continue our commitment to that. And um, it, it, it was interesting because earlier you, you mentioned you can't be everything to everyone. Um, no company can, no brand can, no person can. Um, so I was wondering, you know, your thoughts on how, both of your thoughts on how do you engage with different demographics and different age ranges? Because, you know, there are companies that provide an essential service to a variety of people. And, you know, recently we've seen that younger generations really care more uh, oh, I don't want to say camera, but they're very vocal about social issues and they expect companies to be at the forefront of that. Whereas maybe some other groups and, and generations are thinking, well, it's not, it's not that important as long as the product is good and what I, I need um, is there, that's what matters. So how do you balance the two, I guess, is what I'm, I'm asking. Um, either one of you, please feel free to jump in. Yeah. I I, I don't think it's an either or proposition. I think it, I think it's a, I think it's a matter of you know um, understanding who your core consumers are. I mean, sometimes you have you know a very clear core target audience, and sometimes your audience is is much more broad. Um, and you know, I, but I would say that in general, um, I think you need to speak to identify your core audience and speak to that audience. And obviously, you need for the for those who are not interested in, you know, your position on any social issue or political issue, um, you know, they're looking for the service that they're, they're, they're looking for the product or service that they're looking for. I don't think that that necessarily needs to be at odds, providing great service and providing great products and doing great work needs to be at odds with the fact that you may have uh, a, a position that you hold on, on, on certain issues. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I do, I do think that's tricky. I think there are, you see companies taking a bit of a, of, of a risk, right? I mean, because sometimes companies are coming out with a particular stance that um, is going to, just by definition, it's just going to alienate some consumers. And I think that, you know, that's where your values come in. Mm -hmm. And, and then that under um, yeah. you should, every company should have, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's where your values come in because you have to know whether you, whether you are, um, you know, as long as you're aligned with your values, if it costs you some some customers, I think that that that, that has to be okay. Um, and I and and Emily, if you'd like to jump in, I do have one more question though um, from uh, one of our our many many watchers. Um, do you think it's important for brands to make statements on social or political movements, or is it enough for them? Um, to just have built into their have it built into their business models. How do you avoid avoid seeming performative? I think this is probably a question a lot of people are thinking right now. Um, Emily or, or Leanne? Um, Leanne just answered. Emily, do you want to jump in and what are your thoughts? Uh, politics is such a tricky one. Uh, I don't think every brand needs to necessarily weigh in on politics. I mean, uh, again, it goes. Or social social issues for sure. I think political issues are, are very complex. Um, and it all it depends on, you know, ultimately it depends on what your brand is about, what you stand for, what's your product or service, and whether you feel that that's something you're willing to get behind or whether that's something you want to weigh out of. I mean, I think recently about, um, I think it was the CEO of uh, 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 a 
food company in Canada who, who spoke up recently. I'm sure many of us remember the headlines that he made for, for speaking up about uh, politics and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what an incredible weight that must be because as we know, politics are, is such a contentious issue right now. And it's not just, uh, you know, international politics, national politics, even local politics, you know, uh, provincially, municipally, um, these can be very tricky issues that can have a huge impact on your bottom line. So um, that'll be a decision you'd have to make, of course, with your team and decide, you know, what are the what are the benefits, but also what are the potential liabilities you'd have to deal with. Um, I think around social issues, you know, it comes down to what Leanne was saying, you've got to decide what 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 is the bigger cost and what is the bigger benefit so if you choose to stay out of it and your consumers are expecting you to speak up on a particular issue is it going to cost you a whole bunch of consumers and a whole bunch of brand equity that you won't be able to get back without an incredible amount of effort or do you need to speak up and understand that you may lose some consumers but in the end your core is going to stick with you maybe you maybe it even creates an opportunity for your core audience to grow you may be opening the door for new people to be like, oh my gosh, I now am interested in shopping at Chapters Indigo, for example. I haven't been there in so long because they chose to take the 15% pledge and they chose to support people like Rachel Lee. And they're telling me something about what their brand values. And so I'll be honest with you, maybe that'll mean the difference between the next time I order something, I'm not ordering it from Amazon or I'm not ordering it for somewhere else. I'm now going to go to Chapters Indigo and make my purchase there. So I think um, it's a lot of uh, pros and cons. And, and what it really comes down to is um, getting the right people for a conversation about what your brand stands for, not only now, but what you want to stand for after the tweet or the post or the press release goes in. And, and Leanne, was there anything you wanted to add to that or? That was beautifully said. Uh, no, I mean, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I think that that, that, that is it is, is, you know, do, <laughs> are you, um, are you walking the walk, right? I mean, are you, are you delivering on what you say? I mean, are you putting a message out there and then turning around and treating your employees differently? Um, I think, again, that, the 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 most powerful brands i think are the ones that are aligned from beginning to end like from 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 what the product is from what their aesthetic is to you know how they create their internal culture to how they source products and and and, and find suppliers to you know on and on and on you need to be consistent um because i think right now we are in. We live in a in a in a in a culture where that is the expectation, and that is driving a lot of a lot of change, and 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 that's exciting. And I think that that you know it's it's a, a great opportunity for brands to um, like when you when you start a brand at the very beginning. I think if you know what you're about, um, and you make decisions that are in alignment with with that. Um, with those values, then I think that um, I think that you, you, that's how I think you can build a strong brand. I think, can I just also say, I think it's okay if a brand evolves because you know so much of what we've been talking about is consistency and knowing from the beginning what your values are and kind of continuing to reinforce that in your actions mm -hmm. and your decisions. Um, but if somebody asked me 10 years ago, uh, do I think a decade later, how she hustles would still stand for, you know, diverse women, storytelling, creating opportunities for underrepresented entrepreneurs. I'm not sure I would have known all the answers then. That's of just course. being really honest. Absolutely. You know, when I started, I was like, I just want to host events where women who look like me and not like me can get together and talk about what is it, what is it like to be you, to try and lead um, in the corporate world or to try and be an entrepreneur. And I just wasn't seeing that. Um, in a lot of the other women's networks I went to. I was mm -hmm. younger, wasn't corporately affiliated. I just had a different career path. And I was like, I just wanna be able to talk to others who can relate to my experience. And so I think it's also important since our, our theme is pivot, I think it, it's also important to say to everyone, putting my hand up to speaking to myself that it's okay 
to pivot on or to evolve or to adjust the values that you stand for. Um, and as you learn more about issues that matter to you or that irk you or that really get under your skin or that keep you up at night, it is okay to evolve your thinking and then to evolve your action along with that. And I think it's important that we give ourselves and everyone a bit of grace with that. I think, you know, yes, there's a huge responsibility when you've got a brand, when you've got employees, when you've got a company, when you put something out into the world, but we also have to allow people to, um, to move with the times. We're living in an unprecedented new normal where so many people have no idea what they're doing. Lots of brands. There are big brands who had their A game on and had all these master plans and that has been chucked out the window. Everything has changed. And there are small brands who, um, you know, were on the sidelines for so long, but in the wake of COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, and so many other things, they're now at the forefront of their industry or their movement and making decisions faster and more complex than they ever have. And so I think we need to give people a little room for their brand authenticity to evolve as the world changes at a different pace and also as people get pushed and pressed um, to figure out what those values are. Agree. And unfortunately with that, we are out of time. I feel like I could talk to both of you for hours and hours on end, but we have reached the end um, of our panel. I wanna thank you both so much for sharing your wisdom, um, your experiences, your knowledge um, with myself, with everyone who's watching. Um, and thank you so much. Um, for those who are, who, are, who are there, I just wanna say that you can continue the conversation if you want. Just again, a reminder that the hashtag is zone learning Ryerson U brand activism and and both Leanne and Emily are online as well. So you should definitely make sure to follow them and give them some love as well. Um, with that, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Ryerson. Well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>